Okay, so I'm going to do this one today, um, basically just like this inside of an R Studio thing. Um, because this one is like debugging and interactive, mm -hmm. I figured it would just, it made more sense to kind of work through it like this. Um, mm -hmm. um, so it's not really a markdown object per se, um, but let's just kind of get to it. So this was a nice little chapter on debugging, um, which I, I at least had Googled my way across some of these techniques before for debugging, but I think it's always good to like read them and hear mm -hmm. them. Um, and also to like set out um, kind of a point of view. So sometimes you get bugs, things don't work the way that you want them to do. And oftentimes you don't immediately know why. So the general debugging approach, um, first you should start off by Googling it. Like I would say that 99 point, 2% of my bugs are resolved within a couple of Google pages. Um, so he also mentioned this, uh, this um, library called Errorist, which um, you can turn it on and will automatically, whenever you have an error, although if you have lots of warnings, it will give you lots of Googles. Um, <laughs> so it'll actually immediately either Google or search whatever error or bug you've just had, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, you can turn it off with options error null. So then if we do F again, nothing, I don't get a like funky error. Um, there's also this other package called searcher, which I thought was pretty cool, um, which you can use to, if you're really lazy and don't wanna open up a browser, immediately open a browser for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, which I thought that was nifty. Uh, I had never heard of that before. Um, oh, and just, just a random plug. This is a search engine that plants trees every time you search for it. The guy who wrote the searcher package didn't have Ecosia um, when I opened up the chapter last week, but I made an issue on his GitHub and he added a, a plugin for it. So there you oh, go. That's you so add. nice. Well done. <laughs> Um, okay, so Googling it didn't help you. You should make a reproducible example. You should do that for two reasons. The first reason is that as you make your reproducible example, there's a good chance you'll realize what you did wrong and you'll be able to like stop at that point. The second, of course, is that you need to be able to, you need to be able to test what you think is happening. So that goes into the next point, which is be scientific about it. So make a hypothesis about what is happening design tests for what you think is happening, write down what happened and ask for help from your collaborators. Um, I often find myself just like either explaining my code to a coworker or showing it to them and they immediately see it because sometimes you spend so long staring at something and it's usually like, oh, I forgot a comma. It's usually what it is in, in my experience. So if this doesn't help immediately, um, to start fixing it, you need to build text, test cases. And to do that, you need to find out where your bugs are occurring. All right, let me get this over here. Um, okay, so his first kind of example for finding errors, he creates a call stack that's going to lead to a bug. So we have kind of a nested series of functions, um, F, which calls G, which calls H, which calls I, and I will give us an error if um, D is, num is not numeric. And then it will add D plus 10. And then we have J and then we have K, uh, which function J will just call K and K will immediately throw an error. So we get an error there and now it's gonna be really nice and show me the call stack as it usually does. Mm -hmm. Okay, now work. Am I daft? Should I not be getting the traceback function? I usually do. <laughs> if you if you um, execute it from the markdown, from the chunk, do you get it there? No. What did I do? What did I do? <laughs> 
I swear I read this today. <laughs> um, hmm. Okay, so I, I broke errors. That's fun. Hmm. <laughs> Um, hmm. Have I turned off a preference? The only thing I did today was mess around with the appearance. You know what I'll do? I'll just quit our studio for a second. Anyway, that's my email. Lots of emails. But... <laughs> uh, okay. We're gonna go. Files, documents. This is going to work now. Hey, great. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, I'm going to put that. He didn't say that, but sometimes the debug solution is um, close our, our studio. Sometimes that's <laughs> the solution. It's you have a weird um, series of things open and some packages are overlaying each other or you have a global variable you just forgot about somewhere, sometimes the solution is just close our studio. Um, okay, so we had our error, error, D must be nomadic. Um, we have two options here. Uh, I frequently use the show traceback one, and um, we read this from the bottom up. So we called F of A, which called G, which called H, which called I, which called stop, D must be numeric. The other thing you can do in our studio that I actually never do is rerun with debug, um, which just, maybe I should use it more, um, brings you inside of a browser function immediately. So it brings you inside the function that called it and brings you to the error, which here was inside of this function um, and brings you here. And then of course, as you do, anytime you're inside of browser mode, you can hit stop to leave. Um, what is this going to be showing me? Uh, again, you can do the, the traceback. Um, this will show you kind of the call stack, the calls. Um, oh, this is also to warn you that traceback has some issues with lazy evaluation to figure out exactly where the error is occurring. Um, so in this case, we have to ask, should the error be called what? either here in K or when we called uh, the function I with a non-numeric. Um, here it comes up as being called with K, but I guess you could say it was called from I as well, I think is what he's trying to say. Basically be wary of lazy evaluation is the, the part here. Um, you can also use the last trace to show the error uh, when you use it with a board, which will show a lot more verbose, verbose and last trace here which shows it a little more clearly. And here we read down this way rather than up from the bottom. Um, the next big one that I use, and maybe I shouldn't use it quite frequently, but I do quite frequently use the browser call. Um, so that is for me, the way I like to debug is that I will chuck browser calls in. And what it essentially allows you to do is step inside the function environment. So I will, Put it right above where I think things are going wrong. And then typically what I find is that I have just some something has been evaluated incorrectly. Um, but it works like this. So you make yourself a function, um, which is going to take run the function H of B. And before it tries to evaluate this, we will stop and we will go inside of the environment. So it, you can look here in the environment panel to see everything here that's in my global environment. Let me run this. And now you can see that the environment has changed because we're now in the function environment of BG. And I have a value B, which is A. Um, you can step through this um, using these commands here. 
So that will evaluate. Um, you can, let's do that again. You can stop, continue. Um, I think you can, I think N is next. Um, next, that ends the function. Um, browser is really helpful. Um, that's, 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 browser is my bay. That's, that's my, my, my pitch for browser. Uh, but you can also actually set breakpoints in our studio. Um, they don't work inside of our markdowns, which is why I have this note to myself here. So you can set a breakpoint by clicking right here. Boop. Breakpoints will be activated when this file is sourced. We can source it. And then we can say, what I call the garbage function. We're going to use them later. And now this will step us inside of the, the um, function just as the browser did at that spot. We can use the interactive tools in the same kind of way. Um, next, next, next. That's a loop. I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> It'll, it'll step you through iterations of the loop, by the way, as well. Um, we can unset that breakpoint. Uh, that's how breakpoints work, um, which I thought was pretty cool. I haven't actually used them before, but it seems helpful. Um, OK. You can also use options error recover, which I didn't get what that was supposed to accomplish for us. Oh, that also puts us inside of a browser. Ta-da. Um, or we can turn that right back off with no. Um, Let's see. Oh, um, if you are working non-interactively, -inter say inside of a cluster environment. Um, so if you're running R in a way that it's not interactive, so you are, I I'm saying this from personal experience, this is when I have needed to do this sort of thing. So basically you submit a script to a cluster to be run non-interactively. Um, you can use dump frames to actually recover everything. Um, so you can say, if you have in a batch process, dump and quit, you have a function here, you can say dump frames, um, set it to a file and it'll quit. Um, options error, you can say dump and quit, which is our function, which now whenever you get an error, it will dump everything into an interactive session. And then later you can load it as an R data object. And then you're kind of, you have the same environment so that you can interactively debug it later, which I thought was pretty cool. And then you can do debugger to get inside of the bugging issues. Um, and then finally, in terms of debugging, there is print debugging. Um, so <laughs> I really like his comment that print debugging always works eventually, which is totally true, but <laughs> you know, the one thing I will say is when you forget to remove those print statements to yourself, um, don't forget to do that. Um, so we can have, again, our series of functions and you print where you are. Um, what I like to do is I use print and I use glue to print out what it thinks things are because usually when I find I have bugs, it's because I've made an incorrect assumption about what my function thinks it's receiving. Um, as an aside, is there any reason to use cat versus print? I feel like we had this conversation at one point and I don't remember what the answer was. Like I, I feel like at some point during functions, we had like a brief aside about like when one uses cat or print. And mm. I and I can't remember what the, <laughs> the answer was. I'll post it on the Slack workspace, see if anybody has like a deep burning desire between the two. But it sounds familiar that we had this discussion or there was something I, about it in the book. Um, yeah, there may have been something about it in the book, yeah. I guess we have to read it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
just keep reading the book over and over again. Um, debugging code inside of our markdowns is a bit funky. Um, basically, you should use sync and recover in our markdowns or the rlang traceback functions. Um, but just be aware, I, I think in general, depending on what you're trying to do, probably this is going to be sacrilegious. I don't think you should do most of your development in an R markdown file. I, that's, that's my personal <laughs> opinion. I think you should yeah. you should make an R markdown file when you need to make something pretty and you already know what the pretty thing is going to be. I, I don't know if you want to be doing your heavy lifting inside of an R markdown file, but that's just my two cents. Um, okay. So sometimes you might get a bunch of warnings when you're run, running something. And as we talked about when you're we talking about um, warnings and errors, warnings is something the developer writes. And it could be that the developer has written very sensible warnings and you actually care about those warnings and you're not just going to ignore them. Um, so if you want to turn your warnings into failures, you can get options warn too. And that way, when you get those warnings, you're actually going to be able to use the traceback and the rlang um, last error functions in order to find where those warnings are coming from. Um, although I, I would say I mostly ignore most of my warnings because um, I, <laughs> uh, I trust myself foolishly. Um, that was kind of it for debugging. Uh, there were no exercises in this chapter. Um, so we're going to kind of move right along to measuring performance. Um, so I like, I like this section because it's very practical of things one might want to do. I had never heard of Proviz before. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, we're going to use Proviz, Proviz and Bench. Uh, so R uses what is called a sampling profile, uh, which means that what it'll do if you're trying to profile, so you're, let's say you've got like a big, big function that's going to do X and Y and Z and K and like it's all these things. Um, and you want to know, you know, my function's running really slowly. Is it because I'm trying to, is it reading? Is that where I need to speed things up? Or is it the writing? Or is it the statistics? Where, where is it acting slow? Um, so Proviz allows us to actually kind of visually explore which parts of our code and which parts of our call stock are taking a long time. So the way that sampling profile means is basically while a call stack is going, so while you're doing you know, X and Y and Z and Z and yada, um, R will stop the call stack every few milliseconds to see what's actually being called at that very time. And we can use this Provis tool to explore. Um, so I put the little profiling example into an R script. Um, and the way this thing works is basically and I think that's a pro. Yeah. I'm just going to be explicit with that. Um, so what this is going to do is we've got a little function, which essentially is a pause, another function that calls the pause function, pauses again. And then a third function, which pauses and calls the two little inner pause functions. So the idea being that we're trying to build a slow call stack so we can really look at it with Proviz. Um, and, boop. And I'm going to load in the library. This is the other reason I don't like our markdowns. I don't remember which buttons are pushed. Um, so. Load in Proviz, Bench we'll get to in a second. We'll source that profiling example, and then we Proviz the function f. Woohoo! So this is going to pop up a, if you're working in RStudio, this is going to pop up a profile thing. Um, and what we see first off at the bottom, he calls this a flame graph. So this is telling you what function was called when and how long it took and who was being called at what point kind of on top of one another. Um, there is also at the top, there is each um, function 
and percentage of the time that was spent in each line of each function. There is also a, sorry, no. There's also the data tab over here, which if you've got like a really deep call stack allows you to visualize essentially this data, but in a little more fine tuned way. So you can go provis, F, um, we see here the time and the memory. We then go down F into G, G which called H. Um, so if you have a very deep call stack with a lot of nested things, this can be very useful so that you don't have to look at everything all at once and you can kind of expand as you like. Um, it also, you can see what memory is being used in these functions. Um, these functions aren't taking a lot of memory. They're not really doing much, um, but this, this can be helpful for other functions which might take some memory. Um, so now we've got another function here, which is gonna be garbage function. And basically what this is gonna do is it's going to um, create, it's going to loop a thousand times and just sum unto itself and um, X will get created and destroyed. So we shall source him. Woo. Um, the one thing I did learn is that I don't think ProVis looks very nice in any dark theme R Studio console. And I tried like a bunch of them, but it just kind of looks ugly in all of them. So I don't know. Um, okay, so the thing to watch out here is kind of these memories. And the, the other thing to note is that most of the time of our function is actually spent in this GC thing, which is the garbage collector. Um, when, when you see that the garbage collector is taking up a lot of memory in your code, it's probably a sign that what you are doing is something that is copy on modify behavior. So it's like doing something like a loop where you shouldn't really go through a loop. Um, and that's something we've we talked about at the beginning of like, why is it a bad thing, idea to do loops in R? Um, and the answer is this, this is why it's a bad idea to do loops in R. Um, oh, uh, this kind of imbalance here shows you how much memory is being used and then kind of tossed by the garbage collector. Um, okay. Did I write? I don't know what this does because I feel like, so, so this is the question. And I think the answer is that it crashes your computer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so profile the function following function with torture equals true. What's going on? Read the source code of remove to figure out what's going on. Okay, so I will show you what happens when I run this function. So this function um, goes from what, 10,000 times, it repeats X and then it deletes it. Okay, so I will show you first off what happens when I don't have torture equals true on. Oh, maybe your function was too fast. Um, and then I will show you what happens when I have torture equals true. But first I'm gonna actually, I just did this like an hour before, not this whole thing, but this, cause I had missed this exercise. What does torture equals two? Triggers garbage collection after every torture memory allocation call. Note that memory allocation is approximate due to the nature of the sampling profiler. Okay, what does remove do? Uh, remove can be used to remove objects. Um, okay, so anyway, this is what happens if we run this. This, this happens, it freezes, and then you hit stop a bunch of times, except you can't get out. Oh, we got out. Ooh, last time I had to like force quit our studio. 
Um, so why does doing that create nothing or an endless loop? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out if, oh no, I think it has crashed again, see? See, she, she can't do anything. Anyway, that's okay. I'll just do this again. <laughs> Okay, bye bye. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> My guess is it sends it into some kind of redirect because remove probably clears the garbage collector and then provis probably tries to read from the garbage collector, but there's nothing there to be read mm. is my guess about what's happening um, from this function. So we, we create a function uh we create a variable named x which we immediately remove um and i'm not exactly still sure why this crashes my computer does it crash your guys's computer have you tried it uh i haven't tried it and this doesn't encourage me to try it uh <laughs> Uh, I did go to just now to the solutions thing and it says setting talk triggers to triggers garbage collection after every memory allocation call, which may be useful for more exact memory profiling, but it takes a very long time and it, for this oh. function and it does a lot of work to get the name of the object to delete because it relies on non-standard evaluation is one thing it says, but basically it says we, we remain stuck in profiling. Anecdotally, one of the authors once finished the profiling under an older R version, but the output seemed to not be very meaningful. In conclusion, this question appears to be unanswerable for us, even for Hadley. So I, I think I feel like it's almost unethical to have it in there as a thing to do. <laughs> to be like, do this, it'll crash. As a side note, when I was learning MATLAB, the book I learned MATLAB from, which is a terrible programming language, no one learned MATLAB, um, but <laughs> don't at me. Anybody who's watching this YouTube video who loves MATLAB. Um, <laughs> they had a, an exercise. So it's like, do this. And then you did it. And it crashes your computer immediately. And then the next page is like, did that crash your computer? <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, I think what it was trying to show you is an endless while loop for my memory. <laughs> um, OK. So. This is the unanswerable question. Um, moving on to profiling. Um, profiling with Proviz does not work with C code or C compiled codes. There are other tools for that. Um, so when we get there at some point, really wanting to write our own C++ functions, um, there are tools to do profiling for us in C++ and C, um, but outside the scope of this book. Um, so micro benchmarking. Okay. so. I like to benchmark things. Um, I like to do it sometimes. I think it's fun. There's lots of like data table v tidy tidyverse benchmarks out there. So the only place I've ever used this was to prove to someone that their code was slow and that they should use the data table solution. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I also uh, do it uh, just for fun. I think like if I'm bored, that makes me sound really dirty. Um, so micro benchmarking, the basic idea is that you have a function and you run it a bunch of times and you see how long it takes. Um, you're gonna get a distribution of times because it's in milliseconds. Most of the time, most of the things your computer does is very, very fast. Um, and because your computer, like, you know, my computer is not just having our studio open. I've got Firefox and Slack and Microsoft Outlook. Um, any amount of memory that it's got at any one given second might be slightly different or millisecond might be slightly different. So you get a range. Um, so when you look, you shouldn't just look at the median. I think personally, I, I recommend you look at the max. I can't remember what he says you, you look at. Um, I, I tend to look at the max. We'll see. Okay. So the basic way that it works is, let's say you have a, X is a vector one to hundred. And I don't know why I called it here. We can do a benchmarking by wrapping it simply in benchmark. Um, 
let's do function square root of x or x to the fifth, and we can plot it with an auto plot function. And this is going to show up right there. Ta da! <laughs> okay. So what you have is basically saying here, this is your square root x um, function here. Here, this is your next function, um, x to the whatever. You can, of course, write actual functions to evaluate x. Um, and this is showing you the distribution of all the times. So you have your maximum time, your minimum time. Um, these are, I guess these are what you'd call violin plots. Violin, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and basically, what you can also see is that Mostly, it's very, very fast. I mean, this is one microsecond. Sometimes it might take over a millisecond. Um, in general, you can say, I think, that the square root rather than x to the fifth is faster. Um, this is also true when you look at the maximum value. So that's how that works. Um, use it to impress your friends. Use it to show off to your coworkers. <laughs> Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So there are two other ways to do the square root of a vector. Which do you think will be the fastest? Which will be the slowest? So we have square root x, um, x to the fifth, x to the one half, or the exponent um, of log x divided by two. That should be really fast. <laughs> uh, what do I think is going to be fastest? I think the top one will be slower because it needs to do an extra yeah, so calculation this, and it's already slower. This would be slower. So these yeah. two, would, I would say this is slowest and yeah. then middle and white. What, why, why is this one fastest? Am I missing something? No. Or, I <laughs> are you joking? <laughs> I was like, is there something special about exponents <laughs> and logs? No, I, I was expecting it to be the slowest <laughs> because uh, yeah. you have like two, three extra calculations, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Ready? Let's go. What do we think? How do we do? Why are you struggle blessing on plotting? Oh, it plots dots. Um, actually so we had square root x, and then actually this one's pretty fast. Huh, didn't expect that. <laughs> huh. um, cool. What are the answers? Maybe, maybe, say? The, maybe the, the, what's it called? Prefix infix operator is for some reason slower because You're it fast. needs to convert to a prefix but I mean I don't I don't know because yeah. it's got quite a low I mean it's not going to be this but like it's got quite a low um what's it called priority <laughs> priority of you know when you but I just feel like I guess we are talking about Microsoft you know tiny little uh, what are you so angry about? On a side note. I have to remember if this is how I use it. I use micro benchmark and not benchmark, but I've probably done this wrong because I haven't done it in a while. And it doesn't make a bunch of dots. There's something I don't, I'm not sure if this is quite true, but in the answer stuff, it talks about how the first two are using like primitive functions. And therefore, which ah so so, the, so square root so the is first primitive. one is primitive, and then the exponent log, log and is primitive, so it's written a, a multiple of primitive, and then 
presumably I mean it doesn't say and the other ones aren't but it, I don't yeah. know why it would be saying bothering to say that unless it was saying they weren't um exp primitive functions list uh see so this is a base Oh, it is. I mean, it's it's also a primitive function, I would say, according to the primitive function list. So I don't know. Let's see if I can make this work correctly. I forgot something here. I think that's how this works. Yeah. Um, I think micro benchmark and benchmark are essentially the same. Um, but the micro benchmark object, I think, is easier to deal with. Mm. Um, you, you can tell me what you think. But I, I think, I mean, they do essentially the same thing. So benchmark versus micro benchmark micro benchmark um similar thing i just think this one's easier to deal with and it gives you these I, pretty I like the violins so, so i mean i guess we could we could force it to <laughs> <laughs> to auto plot um yeah and that's it that's it that's it for this this wonderful hmm. two chapters i two honestly chapters. thought i'd I honestly thought I could have gone on to 24 as well, but I was like, yeah, hey, that's going to give it.